My name is Maya. Today, I want to talk about a movie. I won't say this movie is the best movie I've ever seen, and I won't say this movie is the worst movie I've ever seen. In fact, if I was going to try to rate it critically, I would say it's probably pretty middling. But what drew me into this movie is not its objective qualities or faults. What drew me into this movie is the fact that it's endearing as fuck. It's the movie equivalent of comfort food for me despite having zero nostalgia for it. it. has some of the most widely varied cast and crew, an absolutely wild story about its production, and a fervorous cult following that will ensure that this movie lives on forever. This movie is Rockula. such a stupid fucking name. It's also just an excuse for me to do this, so it's fun. Rockula was released in 1990, the year of the launch of the Hubble Space Telescope, voguing Windows 3.0, Eastern and Western Germany's official reunion, Mandela's freedom, and Wilson Phillips's hold on. But don't you know, things can change. And change they did for the cast and crew of Rockula, who had been sitting on a completed film since the year 1988. The year of Rain Man, the literal birth of Rihanna, Beetlejuice, and Tracy Chapman's Fast Car. 1988 was also the year where the OCC found that a significant number of national bank failures in the past decade were due to fraud and insider abuse. A massive internal failure after a decade of overhyped bloating. What better way to describe the 80s and that of the company that produced Rockula, Canon Films? By 1988, Canon Films had a plethora of box office hits under its belt, such as Dr. Heckle and Mr. Hype, Rappin, Castaway, Beauty and the Beast, and Break Into Electric Boogaloo. Okay, so they did actually have some high grossing hits at the time, but one of my favorite little asides to this, um, besides the fact that somehow Electric Boogaloo has been appropriated by the white supremacist movement, is how when Canon Films learned about Beat Street, which was another breakdancing film that was going to be published, they decided that they needed to beat them to the box office, so they absolutely rushed production and put their actors and cast and crew through hell. It's a little story that I think is really emblematic of what Canon Films was all about. If you haven't put it together by now, the owners of Canon Films in the 1980s were pretty convincing, although very conniving salesmen. They would often sell movies just with the poster conceptual art and nothing more. There wasn't a script written, there wasn't a cast put together, there wasn't even a director picked out for the movie. They would sell these movies and use the profit from that sale in order to produce the movies and that was their business model, essentially. On average, the studio made about 20 films a year, which as we all know is definitely an indicator of impeccable quality. The two owners of Canon Films in the 1980s were Menachem Golan and his cousin Yoram Globus. They were both immigrants who found huge success in Israel and their biggest dream was to make it in Hollywood. Menachem was a very passionate filmmaker, though most of his films at the time relied on a young woman with her tits out, action, violence, sexual violence, or a conglomerate of all of the above. His cousin Yoram was known more as the businessman between the two of them, but both of them knew their way around a deal and they ended up having the notorious nickname of the Go-Go Boys. With essentially having a Ponzi scheme as their business plan, it comes as no surprise to know that by April of 1988, they ended up being acquired by a different foreign businessman by the name of Giancarlo Preti, who I'll talk about in just a second. In the Rockula narrative, Menachem was the good guy, seeing as he's the one who gave Rockula the green light. However, Rockula didn't start out as Rockula. It actually was originally a screenplay called Val and Zoe, where Val the vampire falls in love with the young mortal Zoe. The screenplay starts out basically in ye olden times, where Mona is about to let Val bite her and turn her into a vampire to symbolize their undying love for one another. Just before Val can bite Zoe, her dad 
and a priest and an angry mob of villagers come into the room and her dad stabs her, thinking that he's killed her because she's already a vampire. The priest angrily tells him that he has doomed his daughter because he's killed her body without saving her soul. So she's doomed to be reborn again and again until eventually she lives her fate of becoming a vampire. It also has a much more serious tone than Rockula, where the protagonist is this sexy, suave hero and their relationship dynamic is more adjacent to Romeo and Juliet. When co-writer, producer, and director of Rockula, Luca Bercovici, approached Menachem to talk about his concerns about where the studio was heading and also the script for the movie. He's having lunch, he's doing an interview, he's watching dailies, and he's talking to me. And it was, it went like this, so Rockula, so, uh, you know, how much do, uh, also how much do you want to make? And I said, oh, about two million. Why so much? <laughs> you know, and, uh, you know, and he goes, all right, all right, all right. Mm -hmm. You're in pre-production, make it a comedy. So he grin lit the film and in the same breath said, turn it into a comedy. Which as you probably can imagine, that kind of juxtaposition and tone can make for, at the very least, a very strange movie. <laughs> They were given a budget of around one and a half million dollars, which was half a million less than desired. Their pre-production time was about two months in an industry where it's usually anywhere from three to eight, and production of the movie lasted only about five weeks. During production, the studio was mostly hands-off. That was until Menachem left Canon Films due to not wanting to work with Peretti. Some say that he was booted out of Canon Films, but from what I personally gather, it seems more like he was just getting tired of working with Yoram and he really did not like the way that Peretti ran business. Yoram Globus remained at Canon Films and according to Berkovici, hated Rockula. Save a few theater showings, Rockula pretty much went straight to VHS and was really doomed to die in obscurity. As mentioned previously, Canon Films was now in the hands of Giancarlo Peretti, who was an Italian financer, who was a decade later arrested by the FBI and IRS with, quote, misuse of company assets, forgery, embezzlement, and perjury linked to his show business investments in the USA and abroad. The warrant for his arrest was actually issued by France as he had borrowed money from a French bank to finance his 1.3 billion dollar buyout of MGM. The AP at the time stated that the warrant accused Peretti of funneling real estate to his wife, making loans that knowingly could not be repaid, and altering or forging corporate documents. Peretti fled to Italy in 1997 where he was just days away from his trial and out on bail, and he was later found and arrested in 1999. Peretti's story is another complete fucking rabbit hole, but Needless to say, he owed a lot of people a lot of money from a lot of different countries and he did not do a lot of good for Canon Films' reputation. Canon Films is still under operation today, under new ownership, and currently on their website, Canon describes themselves as a young, innovative company with a desire to constantly improve, change, and try new things. Which to me reads as the Tinder bio of a 52 year old with three kids putting their age as 29. I think my favorite part of the Canon Films website is that when you go to click on talent, nothing loads. And when you fill in the URL manually, it just loads a picture of a guy playing a banjo with no caption and a poorly cropped poster of a Chuck Norris movie. Lots of talent going on there. Also, I guess they got Curtis Blow to do a movie called Breakdance Revolution, which was meant to come out in 2018, but has nothing more than a trailer, which is something that exists. This is all completely irrelevant to Rockula, but I just found it mildly interesting. Anyway, there is a documentary on Canon Films called Electric Boogaloo, the wild untold story of Canon Films that I found fascinating and is pretty well rated across the board if you'd like to learn more about the Golan Globus cousins and their era at Canon Films. I think my favorite part about the Golan Globus story is that when they were approached to be featured on the Electric Boogaloo documentary, they instead undercut that documentary and rushed to make their own documentary called The Go-Go Boys, which I don't think there's anything more fitting than that. With all that context in mind, I'd like to talk about the production of Rockula. <laughs> So 
So casting was in the hands of Nancy Laura Hench, who I think did an incredible job of getting the right people for their roles. Everyone involved really threw themselves into the world that was created and embraced what it meant to be an actor in Rockula. Another really crucial aspect in selling the production value of a film from the perspective of a Kansas girl who has no experience on film production is the sets and costumes. Set decoration was done by Donald Elmblad, who at the time just had a handful of set decoration credits to his name. He also did an immaculate job on Rockula, and part of what I really like about this film is that there's such an effective use of set space. Elmblad went on to have a ridiculously successful career as a set decorator, including work on The Outsiders, Malcolm in the Middle, and Michael Jackson's This Is It. He all around just seems like a really wholesome person, and he very deservedly won the Set Decorator's Lifetime Achievement Award in 2014. Costuming was done by a little-known designer at the time by the name of Pamela Scase Levy, who was just starting to make her career. The costumes of Rockula were honestly one of my favorite parts because they really sold the movie and had this perfect balance of late 80s style, gothic, and goofy. During the same year of Rockula's production, Scase Levy met who would, about a decade later, be her co-founder of Juicy Couture. Yes, Juicy fucking Couture and Rockula have ties. Are you starting to see why I I I had to do this video? There's just so there's so many weird little connections and stories. So let's just talk about the fucking movie already. The movie opens with an animation sequence done by Fred S. Kuntz, whose career really did a 360, going from Rockula to then a Pearl Harbor and 9-11 documentary, and then according to IMDb, The Legend of the Evil Count Spatula, which is definitely a video from 2008. I really liked the opening animation sequence. I thought it was pretty well done. It had a really good use of color, and it's a nice little introduction to what you're about to get yourself into. Purely based on the premise, I had a feeling that Rockula was meant to be a campy, fun, but self-aware film, but it was completely confirmed for me in one of the first scenes when we were introduced to our protagonist, Ralph, played by Dean Cameron. Cameron starred in Ski School in 1990, which based on the trailer is the most quintessential 90s post-Animal House film I think I've ever encountered in my life. It also seems to have its own cult following, so much so that a fan of the movie even made a collectible card set for Dean. He's continued acting through the years, including including a role in Straight Outta Compton and a pseudo cameo in It's Always Sunny. I was immediately sold on this film when Ralphie asked his mom, Sophie, to spin around when she asked how she looked. I mean, like, look, if my mom was Tony Basil, I would do the same, but like, it's in context of the film, like, why would you have your mom do the like, let me look at your ass thing? Like, it's, I fucking love this movie. Honestly, for me, seeing Tony Basil, who I am, Extremely ashamed to admit I did not know who she was until I watched this movie. Let the shunning begin. She was all I needed to confirm that this movie would be worth watching. For those of you uneducated plebs like me, Tony Basil is an incredible dancer and choreographer whose career has spanned over 58 years. She's done choreography for American Graffiti, Legally Blonde. Yes, she is Miss Bend and Snap Basil, Once Upon a Time in Hollywood, and countless other films. She was the go-go dancing it girl in the 60s and starred in countless movies, including Easy Rider, and also as a featured dancer in many others, including Viva Las Vegas. She's also done choreography for artists like David Bowie, Tina Turner, and she even directed the iconic Once in a Lifetime Talking Heads music video. Of course, you'll most likely recognize Tony Basil by two words. To this day, she leads workshops and does lectures, and she still looks as fucking flawless as ever. Tony Basil deserves a video of her own, but you can see why she was such an incredible get for this movie. She hasn't taken part of the Rockula reunion stuff, partly I imagine just because she's so busy, but also from what I've seen, she doesn't have the best memories of working on Rockula, and I can understand why she would want to distance herself from that. Anyway, from a viewer's perspective, it seems like this vixen mama loved her role, seeing as she just so naturally fell into it. On my first viewing, she was my confirmation that the actors in this film were 100% there for this. And for me, committed actors are all you really need in a campy movie. For a movie to be endearing, the script, the sets, the props, the makeup, the costumes, all of it can be shit as long as the actors are there for it. But honestly, Rockula didn't have that problem. Like I said, the sets were beautiful, the costumes were fantastic, the makeup and hair crew did amazing, and the script, while 
a little cheesy. It's no Howard the Duck. It still has a legible plot and you can follow the logic. Our protagonist for the film is Ralphie, who- He's a fucking nerd. He's a loser. He lives with his mother and he's he's such a loser that not only does he have a reflection in the mirror, his reflection talks back to him and tells him what a fucking loser he is. Every 22 years, he's destined to meet with the love of his life, Mona, on Friday the 13th. He has until midnight on Halloween for them to fall in love and to protect her or she will be killed by a peg-legged pirate wielding a ham bone. I always love when movies try to craftily place their expositional characters at the beginning of a film, and I low-key have a lot of respect for Rocky Lud for having no pretense about that and just giving it to you with no shame whatsoever. You met this girl, you fell in love, but there was a problem, she had a boyfriend. A pirate. A pirate? Pirate. Whatever. Ralphie talks about his woes to Chuck the Bartender, who is played by Susan Tyrell. Tyrell was a very accomplished actress who, at the time, was creating her own one-woman show called My Rotten Life, A Bitter Operetta, which was a culmination of her talent and cynical sense of humor. Her role in this film is small, but it is so very her. Alongside her expositional conversation with Ralphie is a drunk played by Kevin Hunter, who is from the band Wire Train, best known for their song I'll Do You. Alongside the small musician-related cameos is that of Bo Diddley. Bo Diddley was an incredibly accomplished and talented artist who's considered one of the pioneers of rock and roll. His first TV appearance on The Ed Sullivan Show in 1955 was also his only on The Ed Sullivan Show. Sullivan heard him singing Tennessee Ernie Ford's 16 Tons backstage and asked him to sing that one for the show that evening. There was some confusion when Diddley went on because his cue card said Bo Diddley, 16 Tons which he thought meant he was supposed to perform the song Bo Diddley as well as 16 Tons. He was cut off after playing the first song Bo Diddley and afterward was banned from the show by Sullivan himself because he didn't follow directions. Apparently, Sullivan said that he wouldn't make it another six months in showbiz, and boy was he dead fucking wrong. The song he performed, Bo Diddley, was so iconic and influential that even to this day in music, there is a beat referred to simply as the Bo Diddley beat. <laughs> Diddley has a wide range of accolades from being in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, the Blues Hall of Fame, and being awarded the Grammy Lifetime Achievement Award. The cast and crew of Rockula also spoke really high of him. The most awesome person on the planet. He was a wonderful person to be around. He so naturally just went right into the theater of the absurd effortlessly. Some people took a little squeezing to get them in. He, he was like, boom, he's in. It was great. He was wonderful. He was like a wonderful person. Yeah. And he was just there to be his part. I was really curious as to why with all these musicians in the cast, including Thomas Dolby, who I'll discuss in a minute, they didn't have more of a part in the soundtrack. He'll explain that all these musicians, though incredibly talented, didn't really make the music that had the sound they were going for, which was more of the pop 80s sound. Anyway, just as the clock strikes midnight on Friday the 13th, Ralphie leaves the bar only to get hit by a car where, who would have guessed it, is driven by Mona. She's wigged out, he's a mess, he gives her a kiss and runs away to the gas station bathroom. Typical men. We get some more roasting and exposition between him and the mayor, including a direct mention of Ralphie's timeline. It's about this, Mr. Wise Guy. This happened every 22 years so that means in the last 400 years i have met fallen in love and lost mona 14.5 times i i know i know this is an incredibly minute and unimportant detail but this has constantly annoyed me and driven me mad about this movie so he says that this issue with mona has happened every 22 years for the past 400 years meaning that he has met fallen in love with and lost Mona 14.5 times. 400 years divided by 22 years would make it 18.18 times, and 14.5 times multiplied by 22 would make it 319 years, not 400. So does that mean they both met when they were 103 years old? Because 400 years minus 319 years equals 81 years, plus 22 gets us to the age when they first met, assuming they both met at 22 and also are the same age. 400 years minus 103 years old they were when it happened leaves us with 297 years, and 297 years divided 
divided by 22, the age that they were, means that it would have been 13.5 times that it happened, not 14.5 times that it happened. And even then, Mona couldn't have been 103 because there's no way a mortal from that time would live to 103 years old without already being a vampire, meaning that this whole story wouldn't even happen because she already would have been a vampire. And also, I know the 0.5 is supposed to be a fun, cute little throwaway line, but it adds to this, this madness that is going on within me. Throughout the movie, he has a bit between him and the mirror, and while it's funny, it's a bit confusing world building wise. How does he have sex with these girls? Are they in Ralphie's world? If so, what the fuck are they doing in the mirror world? This never really gets resolved or explained, and I'm just gonna add it to my list of Maya shut the fuck up and just watch the movie things, but I'm just putting it out there. I'm just putting it out there. That's not acknowledged. That, that, that never links up. The mere Ralph at least does have some character motivation, which is that once Ralph gets Mona, he can leave the mirror world. But also, wouldn't that then mean that there's two Ralphs running around in the world? Is it his twin? Is it his evil anti-self and it's like a sonic anti-sonic situation? Will there be a future where now that the suave, more cunning Ralph is free and in the same world as Ralph that he'll take Mona away from him? Just putting it out there. In the next scene, Mona, played by Tawny Fair Ellis, is in the studio with her bandmate Robin, played by Nancy Ferguson. Ferguson has done a number of other acting roles, including starring in Phil Collins' I Wish It Would Rain Down music video, and is a founding member of The Visiting Kids. The Visiting Kids were composed of children of the band members of Devo, as Nancy was at the time married to lead singer of the band Mark Mothersbaugh. There's not much to really say about The Visiting Kids besides it was a cute novelty of the time with a somewhat cynical spin. Tawny also went on to do a few other acting roles, including on General Hospital. In 2021, she released the album Love Life and proves that she still does have those vocal chops. In this scene, Mona is shown a commercial for Stanley's Death Park, starring her ex-boyfriend who is still her band manager. This character is definitely taken from Val and Zoe, who was named Derek, and that character was far more abusive and evil as opposed to the self-centered and jealous Stanley played by Thomas Dolby. But Thomas Dolby is the reason I'm even doing this video essay. I initially decided to start a video essay on Thomas Dolby after watching Todd in the Shadows video on She Blinded Me with Science, where he noted some absolutely wild things that Dolby has accomplished throughout his career, including starring in Rockula. While working on the video essay for Thomas Dolby, I stumbled on this tweet, which got me thinking, damn, that's pretty cool that this Facebook group with less than 500 people in it were able to get a hold of Dolby and have him become part of this cult classic community. Now I need to know <laughs> what this movie is about. Thomas Dolby did some really iconic synth music in the 80s. He went on to work in the tech industry for a while and then came back in 2011 with his album A Map of the Floating City. He also did a live performance documentary film in 2013 called The Invisible Lighthouse that has not been released publicly, which I am not so patiently waiting for him to release. I'm looking at you. I'm looking into your soul. I know it's one of those like you gotta be there to really experience it but like my boy my boy please <laughs> Anyway, he's currently a professor at Johns Hopkins University and is also just the sweetest boy. So Dolby plays Stanley, Mona's ex-boyfriend band manager, and in the first scene, they even have a cute little reference to his love of synths. The Stanley's Death Park bits in Rockula are absolutely my favorite, and it's not just because I'm a little fangirl, they really are some of the fan favorites, so much so that there's even an indie film studio in Texas named after it. The Stanley's Death Park songs themselves were written by Dolby, which explains why they're so fucking catchy. During the first Stanley's Death Park scene, they give some foreshadowing to the cryogenic freezing process to come. And then we see some of Mona's wandering mind for who the hell that guy she hit her car with was. So dreamy. Ralphie comes home after being hit with a car and tells his mom about her day. They have another one of those cheeky dork guy has a hot mom sequences featuring Tony Cox, who you'll likely recognize from Friday, the Bad Santa franchise, epic movie, and disaster movie. After her bath, Sophie comes in to tell Ralph to get his shit together and save Mona before she dies. Ralph goes to bed and the scene transitions into a music video dream sequence that is deliciously 80s. Honey, go to sleep.
Bonus sings Break These Chains, a song's about waiting for Ralph to save her while the pirates overtake the stage and come after her, all while Ralph weakly watches it all go down until he's awakened from his nightmare. This is another similarity that Rockula has with the original Val and Zoe script, except that in that one, the protagonist Val is having horrible night terrors about the war he was in and getting bitten by a wolf-like creature that turned him into a vampire. I'm mainly mentioning these comparisons between the scripts, one, because I read the whole goddamn thing, and two, because it really helped me understand why Rockula is the way it is in terms of some of the scenes that don't quite make sense and also the tonal shift that they had to do to go from a serious, sexy, dark script to a goofy dick joke making, but also I guess this movie is okay for kids type script. After this nightmare, Ralph realizes that this might be his last chance to save Mona, so he nuts up and decides to go for it. He starts searching around the local band scene, and there's some cute little nods to 80s hair bands, red hot chili peppers. He also has this scene with his mirror self, which I don't really have any commentary on, I just need to show you. That's better. I wonder if, uh... Ralph, would you look at the size of this? Anyway, Ralph finds Mona performing in Club Hell and we go to her song sequence of Turn Me Loose. She actually talked about this scene in the reunion about how she was a little unsure about the costume choice. I remember that little tiny outfit you put me in for the <laughs> turn so me loose. You, you so I was like, okay, I'm naked and I was freaking out. And I remember Luca's coming up to me and he's like, you're fine. I'm like, no, I don't think so. I don't think I, I, I it's just, I, I don't think I can do this, you know? <laughs> and you just got in my ear and you were like, get the fuck out there. Because you look so, you look so on. amazing. I mean, <laughs> I, 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 Personally, I think she looked amazing. I don't see what she was worried about. The song has a bunch of random animal noises in it and it's just your classic 80s rock synth beat. <laughs> During her performance, she locks eyes with Ralph and they have a brief moment until he disappears and she goes back to finishing the performance. This is another scene where I was like, wait, why the hell did he disappear? Especially if they're just gonna meet backstage immediately after her performance. But in the original script, this is actually the first scene where Val and Zoe haven't met yet and this is the first time Val sees Zoe. So it makes more sense as to why he mysteriously disappears. They meet after the show and she asks him who the hell he is he lies and says he's also a musician. Stanley gets jealous and tells the bouncers to kick him out and the bouncers properly bounce him. Also, I have no idea what the fuck Ralph says right here. It just eludes me. You are very strange, Ralph. You ain't a woofing. <laughs> Mona, darling. Wherein Val and Zoe, the sexy suave Val, can disappear before the bouncers get to him and toss him out, Ralph is kicked out and it becomes sound effect central. Ah! Ralph then heads back to the bar and discusses his woes of how he's going to figure out what to do about the musician thing. Ralph and Bo Diddley's character Axeman have this cute little bit where they play a blues riff and instead of him singing, it's dialogue of him whining about how he can't get her. Let's face it, I don't have what it takes. How can I save her if I can't even talk to her? Maybe I'll see your band sometime, she says. What a joke. <laughs> Why don't you, why don't you start my own band? They have the necessary montage of trying different band types out and then his mirror gives him the band name. You're doing what? You're starting a rock band? A vampire in a rock band. What are you gonna call it? Rockula? Rockula. Rockula. He leaves a brochure for Mona to come see the show and the next scene transition is this fantastic Munsters-esque souped up Model T and Stanley parking like shit. Stanley, Mona, and Robin walk up into the club and Rockula plays. And it's, well, it's what you imagine it would be. You don't walk. He glides. With bat wings and fangs. He's a bloodthirsty dude! Neighbors cry. Mona goes to meet him backstage and they have a cutesy little walk back to her apartment and she gives him a kiss on the cheek. The next morning he comes downstairs and Tony Basil breathes a little more life into this thing and tells Ralph to go get the girl. Though the audience sees her creepily peeking out of the window. Maybe I was just ignorant, but the first time I watched this, the foreshadowing of this scene really didn't make itself apparent to me. But that's also not to say that the plot twist later in the movie was very surprising either. We see Stanley lingering around and creeping more and more, and he seeks out a fortune teller that tells him, She thinks she loves you. 
but she really loves you, Stanley. Really? Yes, but she is under his spell. Spell? Spell, Stanley, for this is no ordinary man. He is a vampire. A vampire? A vampire, Stanley. Yours is no ordinary destiny. I knew it. Don't interrupt. It is your destiny to save Mona. Yes, but how can I do it? Stanley, your business is dead. Your life is dead. Your destiny is dead. You must kill her, Stanley. Yes? Yes. And then she will be all yours. I could mount and stuff her. She will be your sleeping princess. Yes, yes, I see it. I could freeze her cryogenically. Oh. I suppose they will wear. She'll be mine. All mine forever. When do I do it? It must be done on Halloween. Right. But there is one catch, though. You must dress as a pirate. A pirate? A pirate with a rhinestone peg leg. A rhinestone peg leg? A rhinestone peg leg. And you must dispatch her with a ambon. Ambon. OK, 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 OK. Ambon. The next scene is the most 80s thing you'll ever see. And they just, they come out so strong. There was this girl named Mina. She wanted Moena. Are you the DJ? No, I'm the vampire. I said I'm the vampire. Based on the costuming and the spandex and the fact that Ralph is wearing tidy whities over his leotard, it's very apparent that this is a self-aware scene, but still, after watching this, I needed answers. I was so desperate to understand why Rapula was on the same plane of existence as I am. Apparently, and unsurprisingly to learn considering the script situation, there were no songs planned out in Rockula. There was just scene, a song goes here, and then the next scene. So they made up these different songs along the way. Hill and Dean concocted Rapula together and in a day they completed it, which I think explains everything. Somehow, despite watching all of that, Mona still has the hots for Ralph and they go on a cutesy little date sequence that transforms into a quintessential 80s rock love ballad called By My Side that has gotten stuck in my head so many times on so many occasions. It was always this way from the start This scene also features the visiting kids who we'll see later in the film. Dean and Tawny during the Rockula cast reunion actually performed an acoustic version of the song, which was really fun to watch. This scene then transitions into being Mona's music video that she's been super excited to premiere, which I thought was a clever use of resources. It's also a little confusing world building wise, but I'll let it slide. I don't know, but it was definitely beautiful. Hmm. Immediately after that, Stanley plays his next commercial and steals Mona's thunder, which only further pisses her off. Get out! That was the best bit! He also starts to nudge Ralph a bit with a few awful vampire puns. The kids then head over to have dinner at Ralph's mom's, where, once again, Tony Basil endears the hell out of us and Mona. This scene also has a little cameo by Rick Zumwalt, who plays Boom Boom, another one of Phoebe's random lovers. Zumwalt was a professional arm wrestler who made quite a few cameos in his time, including another canon film classic called Over the Top, starring Sylvester Stallone, who plays a scrappy young underdog fighting to win an arm wrestling competition. After dinner, the kids go to the parlor to have coffee where Phoebe has a fantastic dance number because of fucking course she does. She's Tony goddamn Basil. Honestly, she has the best song in the entire movie.
This song was worked on in part by artist Asun Lande, who was then credited by the name of Carlos Warren, who apparently got the song done incredibly quickly and like nobody's business. He was only about 19 years old at the time and he is yet another accomplished artist who somehow was on Rockula. Unfortunately, the song does have a little mini rap segment, but it's not too painful and it's kind of cutesy the way they did it, so it's all right. My mom's kind of strange, if you hadn't noticed. This whole night has been kind of strange. Phoebe's dance and song freaks out Mona a bit, but nothing could be more scary than that of Ralph's clinginess. Mona, would you give up everything for me? Your career, your friends, everything? Wow. Don't you think that's a little bit radical? I mean, maybe we should date for a while first, don't you think? The two wind up in a graveyard, and in this scene, he shows her old mementos from a music box and mentions how they looked at it at the house. The scene at the house of them looking at the music box it was actually cut from production and is another one of those little things while watching that make you go, wait, what? So I'm glad I learned this because it helped me better understand why it didn't make sense. And it made me feel a little bit better to know that the production team and the people behind the film didn't want the scene to be cut out. Okay, you remember this? You said you did back at the house. I do. I remember that from somewhere. 1786. You owned it in 1786. Despite Ralph's constant pleading and reminders, Mona still doesn't believe Ralph. So the only way he can prove it to her is to Leave me no choice. Now watch close. I haven't done this in years. I'm not very good at it, so bear with me. Hi. Mona freaks the fuck out and runs away. Ralph has a sad boy sequence, and then we see Mona have a sad girl sequence too. In this sequence, we get Thomas Dolby's Budapest by Blimp playing in the background, which... Mona then has a nightmare about the pirates and realizes that Ralph's right and she realizes that she needs him just as much as he needs her. Ah, sweet codependence. In the next scene, Stanley is trying to get his costume together and calls up the fortune teller, Madame Benoit. We get another disjointed reminder that Mona's trying to find Ralph and she's running late and also gets her chonies stolen for some reason. And Ralph is back at it and excited to find Mona and get his shit together. I haven't seen her for days. And Ralph, I haven't seen him either. I'm back! Stanley meets up with Madame Benoit and... Are you doubting Madame Benoit? Oh, no, 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 no. Do I sense that you are wavering from your destiny? No, Madame Benoit. Do you love Mona more than life itself? <gasps> yes. And you will save her from the vampire? Yes, Madame Benoit, yes, yes! You remember. Before midnight! What? Who could believe it? It was Phoebe the whole time! Then Ralph and Stanley have some cutting words for each other backstage, followed up by an unprovoked dance sequence between Tony Basil and breakdancer Crescendo Ward, which was actually completely improvised. Since Mona's running a little late, we have an excuse for a song sequence by the visiting kids called The United States of Beat, and then a little bit later, Ralph and Mona are reunited on stage. As they reunite on stage, Ralph sees his mom in the crowd, which is the perfect distraction for... <laughs> Stanley drags Mona away, and then Ralph somehow has enough time to go talk to his mirror before she's about to get murdered. Ralph makes it up and they have a fight sequence that includes the best 5.1 seconds of the entire film. They keep fighting and there's one very okay dad joke. Die, vampire scum! Ow! Oh! That was my mother you just boned. Then the only way to defeat Stanley is to transform into a terrifying vampire that makes fart noises during its transformation and disgusts Stanley so much that he backs into the cryogenic chamber. Stanley's frozen away. Sophie comes up and asks Ralph for forgiveness. Mona and Ralph are reunited. The end. Right? No, no. 
no, 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 no. How could we forget about anti-Ralph, who is now freed and comes out and does a song number as an Elvis impersonation? And then the movie's over. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, that's Rockula. But before we end the video, let's get in a quick word from our sponsor. This video is sponsored by fucking nobody. What's worse than a content creator making a consistent livable wage creating the content that you love to watch? Why, sitting through an ad read. Look, there's nothing worse than having a one minute skippable ad play at the end of an hour long video that you're able to consume on demand at no out of pocket cost. That's why, with fucking nobody as my channel's official sponsor, you'll never have to worry about me making a sustainable income off of my countless hours of creative labor or sitting through another pesky ad read. Maybe someday I'll have enough people who care about what I do to create a Patreon, but that will be the only time I shill myself out. Until then, thanks to fucking nobody for ensuring that young upstarting creatives like me have to pursue their passion through sheer force of will and spare time alone. Fucking nobody, the only brand you can trust to market to your audience because it doesn't fucking exist. I wouldn't be here today making this video if it weren't for the absolutely die-hard cult following that Rockula has. One of the reasons that I like the internet is because of things like this, where there's just this little community of people who say, look at this silly, goofy, dumb romp of a movie, and don't we all love it? Yeah, we do. It's nice when you can find places on the internet that are just that, you know? This weird little movie that was doomed for VHS obscurity had life breathed back into it because people cared enough. One of the biggest champions of Rockula is superfan Michael Sims, who organized the cast reunion and who got Thomas Dolby to come on for an interview and also the Halloween viewing. There actually was another scene that was cut from Rockula, which was Thomas Dolby singing Tom Lehrer's I Hold Your Hand in Mine, which I don't know if it would have even seen the light of day if he hadn't have brought it up to Dolby. Dolby also went through the work of getting it digitally remastered and even recreated the song, and it's an absolute delight to watch. Another wholesome labor of love is the bootleg soundtrack of Rockula that was remastered and shared within the community. Because of this tight-knit little community, I was able to get a hold of Hill and Luca Bercovici and put a lot of these pieces together that were missing for me around Rockula. So I really want to thank the fans of Rockula Facebook group for welcoming me into the community and being such a wonderful little place on the internet. If you watch Rockula and love it the way I do, I definitely recommend you join the Facebook group. I also want to thank Hill and Luca Bercovici themselves for taking the time out of their day to talk to me and answer my questions. And for those interested, I will link those interviews in the description below as well. Despite all my tiny quips and complaints, I really do love Rockula. It's a fun, silly movie that I definitely will revisit every Halloween. But what really I love about it most are all of these different stories. When I think about Rockula, I think about what can be possible when people who really care about something come together and work to make it happen, whether it's the cast and crew of the movie itself or the following today that is keeping it alive. If you'd like to watch Rockula and get your own copy, I will link into the description to that to where you can get the Blu-ray. You also can watch it on Tubi for free, which is what I did, and I just muted it during the commercials. So yeah, Grab a friend, get some popcorn, and enjoy an evening watching Rockula because it's its own experience that I this video could never do justice to. Thank you so much for taking the time to watch. This video has been a real labor of love that I've been working on for quite some time now. This is actually my second time recording this because I, for some reason, am just cursed to not record decent audio. But Thankfully, my dear Gavin helped me out through it, and this is just going to be what you get. <laughs> you notice some slight shot differences and things like that. Well, that's, uh, I'm doing the best I can, and I hope to make more videos like this where I really 
put in more time and effort into getting it in a higher resolution quality and a better audio quality and also do this kind of thing where it's more of a set every time. I think it's really fun to put it together and think about what to do with that. And uh, yeah, I sincerely hope you enjoyed watching this video. <laughs> um, yeah, all right. Well, bye.